The Bain Free Radio Hour. On this week's podcast, science. Specifically, looking at what insights an orbital biomedical laboratory could give us into ways to mitigate the dangers of microgravity and cosmic radiation. Plus, part 46 of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Let's get started. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. Glad you're here with us. I'm contributing editor Gray Reinhardt, once again sitting in for editor Tony Daniel. Dr. Ted Roberts, science advisor to print and television writers, gives us insight into on-orbit medical research that may increase the chance of success for long-duration space missions. And we also continue our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. And now... Here's the news. Since our topic this week is science, how about some science news? In space science, this week in 1930, Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto while studying starfield photographs he had taken in January. And this week in 1996, NASA launched the Near Shoemaker spacecraft to explore asteroid 433 Eros. But since our interview this week mixes space science with biology, we should note that this week in 2001, the magazine Nature published the first draft of the complete human genome. In literary history, this week in 1954, Scottish author Ian M. Banks was born, and in 1968, British author Warren Ellis was born. This week in 1926, U.S. author Richard Matheson was born. Probably best known as the author of the 1954 horror novel I Am Legend, Matheson was also a prolific screenwriter whose credits include the Twilight Zone episode Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, and the Star Trek episode, The Enemy Within. Matheson received the World Fantasy Award for Life Achievement in 1984, the Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Horror Writers Association in 1991, and was inducted into the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame in 2010. Another Hall of Fame member, very familiar to Bain fans, was also born this week in 1912. Andre Norton, the first woman to be named a Gandalf Grand Master of Fantasy, the first woman to be a Sifwa Grand Master, and in 1997, the first woman inducted into the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. Bain has been reprinting Ms. Norton's novels for many years, and our most recent reprint was an omnibus trade paperback, The Secret of the Stars, which combines her novels Star Hunter and Secret of the Lost Race. And, of course, it's available on Bain.com. Speaking of Bain, we remind you of February's mass market paperback release, David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore, the tenth book in the best-selling Republic of Cinnabar Navy series of space adventures, also known as the Lieutenant Leary series. You can find this book at booksellers everywhere, This is part one of a two-part interview with Dr. Ted Roberts, neuroscientist and author of the science article, A Translunar Laboratory, Hurrah, available on Bain.com. With over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers and nearly 200 conference presentations and additional publications, Dr. Ted Roberts teaches fans and writers alike about the science behind hard science fiction. Known to many Bain fans as the speaker to lab animals, Ted is a neuroscientist by day, studying the effects of drugs and disease on memory and cognition, and an advisor to science fiction and fantasy authors, video game developers, and television writers in his spare time. 
Dr. Roberts earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, San Antonio, his master's from Lehigh University, and his doctorate from Wake Forest University, and is an active researcher who applies what he has discovered to help writers create realistic future brain-computer interfaces, unusual diseases and their cures, and alien intelligences. His presentations at science fiction and fantasy conventions are very popular and range from open-ended Ask a Scientist sessions to detailed presentations on topics ranging from the mysteries of the brain to surviving the apocalypse. Ted also writes short fiction, including the novelette They Also Serve in the Riding the Red Horse military science fiction anthology that came out late last year. And he writes entertaining science fact articles for the science fiction and fantasy community. We're here today to talk about one of those, his latest, which is available right now on the Bain.com website and is entitled A Translunar Laboratory. Hurrah! Ted, it's been almost exactly two years since you were last on the podcast. Thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Gray. I'm very happy to be here. Now, Ted, I found your article to be very, very interesting. And I understand, well, you say right in there that it came about because of your participation in a couple of recent workshops. Uh, Would you give our listeners a little background on those events? Well, sure, Gray. The workshop is the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. And it is a gathering of individuals who are very interested in the technologies, the engineering, and the science that it would take to get humans off of the Earth and out to interplanetary and even interstellar destinations. The group is a fairly informal working group, but we have a number of fairly high-placed space scientists, including Bain's own Les Johnson. And Les invited me a couple of years ago to the second meeting of the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. I was a little thought maybe I would be a little bit out of place as a biologist among a bunch of uh, physicists and engineers until we started talking about what would it would actually take to get humans to survive and to get to their destination uh, fully functional, uh, able to walk around in gravity, able to be healthy and complete their tasks. So at the time, I had said, you know, what we really need to do is we need to get a full-function laboratory up there. The space shuttles and the International Space Station are quite uh, good at doing small-scale experiments, but we need some large-scale experiments. So the organizers of TVIW invited me back to actually talk about the laboratory. And so last November, at the third meeting of the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, I presented a talk that I called, There's Nothing Like a Little Biomedical Science in Space. Now, how many folks uh, attend these workshops, Ted? We had, I would say, around 100 to 150 people attending. We also had a group. uh, It it varied. Uh, Not everybody stayed the entire time, but... We uh, had also, I'm going to say, about 30 presentations, uh, people presenting, also work groups that would get together and discuss some of the breakout ideas, what to do about communication, what to do about the actual biosphere or uh, living arrangements, the life support system, uh, new ideas for propulsion and for ship design, things like that. But, it, again, it was about 100 to 150 people. And almost all of them, as I understand it, are researchers or scientists or engineers who are affiliated with with the agencies that are, would be involved in putting together missions like this. Is, is, that, is that true? That is, well, it's mostly true. We have writers as well, and uh, and most prominently, uh, 
Bain Books was a sponsor of the workshop, and Bain's publisher, Tony Weisskopf, was in attendance, and a few of the Bain authors as well. Uh, one of the things that was offered as part of this year's workshop was some actual uh, uh, symposia, some seminars for writers that would give them some of the background needed to be fairly technically accurate in their writing. Well, and we certainly appreciate that. If it's going to be science fiction, uh, it needs to be plausible and uh, and line up pretty well with what we know about science. And I'm all for that, too. Well, getting into the specifics of your, your article, um, our regular listeners are probably aware of at least some of the hazards of human spaceflight, but let's go over a few of them, at least for the benefit of, of anyone who may not know what they are. First, what is the problem with microgravity? Most of us who live on this planet are continually subjected to one gravity on our bodies. And the reason why I say most of us is if you, uh, uh, any creatures that live in an aquatic environment or who for whatever reason are bedridden don't necessarily have the same force, but as a human being stands, the gravity pulls fluids. Uh, the body is um, mostly fluid, mostly water, and that water is pulled from the head down to the feet. So, there are a number of adaptations of the human body that are designed to work against one gravity, constant force. We have long bones in our legs that are very strong. We have the pelvis, the hips, are designed to actually cradle the stomach, the liver, the intestines, the internal organs, and our circulatory system is designed toward pumping the fluid out of the legs, out of the lower extremity, extremities, and into the brain that is going to need the blood, is going to need the oxygen and the sugars in order to function. So the entire body is adapted to one gravity. When you take that away, those functions don't work right. There's no longer the constant push and stretch on the muscles and the bones, and the bones tend to lose calcium and phosphorus. The fluid, which would ordinarily be collecting in the lower body, is evenly distributed. So there's a lot of swelling. And if you notice any of the pictures of astronauts, you'll notice that their faces are quite round and puffy. And that's because the fluid that would ordinarily be pulled out is collecting in the face, in the head, around the neck. Uh, this changes how the heart functions. Uh, not having to stand against gravity changes how the muscles function. And in fact, they tend to get weak. And there's another problem that's actually very little known is that there is a change in pressure around the eyes. And so there can be some very distinct visual problems that occur in microgravity. So all of this is the body just is not adapted to microgravity. After a short period of the absence of gravity, then when the human returns to Earth, they, they've lost calcium from their bones, and their bones are weaker. They've lost muscle strength, and their muscles are weaker. And now the heart has to work harder because it's pumping fluid against gravity, and the body has to readapt to all of the fluid accumulation in all the different places where it will be. So the, one of the biggest issues with microgravity for a long-duration space flight that has, at the end of it, exploring a planet is whether or not the human would be too weak to do the exploration once they reach the planet. Yeah, that would pretty much uh, result in a mission failure, I would think. That it would. Uh, the only way to handle that, of course, would be to not land the human and to have them teleoperate robots, but that gets us into a whole other set of situation in terms of getting and establishing a colony that would allow humans to live there. And it still doesn't deal with 
bringing the human explorers back to Earth and having them return to Earth and return to a normal life. And, of course, one of the more recent suggestions has been to just send a colony there with no intent of returning, but still the problems that you have talked about in terms of those changes that occur during the flight would have to be resolved before they could begin operating down on the surface of Mars. That's right. And one of the big unknowns at this point is what is the difference between a human in one gravity and the approximately one-third gravity of Mars and the one-sixth gravity of the Moon. We really don't know whether the changes that we see with microgravity are going to be completely reversed at one-third or even one-sixth gravity for a Mars or a Moon colony. So this, again, is one of the unknowns in which we do not know what is going to be necessary to allow the humans to cope and to adapt to their environment. Now, you mentioned the little-known effects on the eye, and those are fascinating to me. Is it more a question of changing visual acuity, or are there other problems that manifest with that? There's a number of different problems. That's actually the sort of thing that I'm setting about to learn in my own research and education. In this case, I'm talking library research. I'm not doing any laboratory research at this point. I'm trying to educate myself on what is going on. I would recommend to readers, anyone who is interested, there is a very good article in the most recent Smithsonian Museum Air and Space Magazine called How Long Can We Live in Space? Or How Long Can an Astronaut Live in Space? And one of the things it talks about is part of what NASA is doing to study the effects of microgravity, and there is mention in there about some of the problems that have occurred with vision of the astronauts, uh, particularly returning to Earth. Well, that's a great resource. Appreciate that. One of the other hazards that you talk about in your article is the hazard of radiation that astronauts will uh, be exposed to once they uh, are outside of the Earth's magnetosphere. And you specifically talk about a problem that is directly related to your field, which is neuroscience. Could you tell us a little more about that? Sure. One of the projects that I work with is one that's looking at effects of radiation on the brain, and particularly on cognition and memory. In the field of cancer therapy, there are two different types of therapy that involve using radiation on the brain in order to treat cancer. One is gamma knife, which uses a very finely focused beam of gamma radiation. Uh, the other is whole brain irradiation when cancer is fairly widely distributed and diffuse then it can be necessary to irradiate the entire brain one of the things that patients have found and the doctors have found in the cancer field is that there are after effects to the radiation and one of those after effects is that people tend to feel um, that they're a little bit fuzzy mentally, or they may have difficulty with their memory. So there are ongoing studies to look at the effects of radiation on the brain. Now, when a person receives radiation that is for therapeutic use, they're basically getting either x-rays or gamma rays. Those are photons. That is strictly energy. There's no particles involved. Out in space, radiation comes in a number of different uh, modalities, uh, different types. That includes photons, uh, you know, pure energy radiation, but there's also electrons and protons, and in particular, some heavy protons that can do more damage. So one of the questions that comes up is, in the space environment where radiation is mixed, 
what is the long-term prospect in terms of damage to the body and damage to the brain. Now, that's very interesting. One of the things that I learned from your article uh, is a little bit more about the radiation that we're exposed to every day, and in particular, this thing that you called the banana equivalent dose. Could you tell our listeners a little about that and how that compares to the radiation that uh, astronauts may encounter on a long-duration space flight? Sure. Uh, banana equivalent dose is something that you'll find a lot of uh, uh, people, nuclear physicists, talk about and joke about a lot. Bananas have potassium, and potassium comes in two isotopes. Most potassium has a molecular weight of 39. It has 19 uh, protons and 20 neutrons. But occasionally you'll get a potassium molecule that has 19 protons and 21 neutrons. And so that is potassium 40, 40 molecular weight. When that decays to the standard isotope of potassium, there is a release of gamma radiation. So in a typical average-sized banana, there is enough potassium-40 to release a small amount of radiation. Now, that small amount of radiation is pretty much at the limit of what we can detect. That is extremely small, and the measurement that is used is that it is one one millionth of a gray or one one millionth of a sievert. Those are the two uh, units of measure used for radiation. Gray is the term, grays and, uh, uh, of radiation is what the object is exposed to, what the body is exposed to. There are a number of different effects, depends on what type of radiation and what tissue of the body is exposed that give you a weight, number of weighting factors. Once those are taken into account, the effectiveness of the radiation is called sieverts. But for the banana equivalent dose, the uh, grays and sieverts are exactly the same. One one millionth of a gray or one one millionth of a sievert, or in the typical terminology, one micro gray. That's the banana equivalent dose. Now, if you take a coast-to-coast -coast plane flight, about five hours, you'll be exposed to about 25 micrograys, uh, 25 times the banana equivalent dose. This is an extremely small dose. For example, a CT scan or an X-ray is going to expose a person to about 10 to 50 milligrays, and milligrays, now that's a thousand times more than a microgray, but it's still a very small amount of radiation because we don't start seeing things like uh, cancer risk until we start getting up to a tenth of a gray uh, or even one gray's worth of radiation. Now, the problem that we run into in terms of space is that the amount of radiation that an astronaut is exposed to in a year on the International Space Station is about 0.15 grays. Uh, a six-month transit to Mars is about, two point, is about 0.25 grays, and again, we get something similar when looking at the... Um, uh, three years on Mars, we may be looking at something to the effect of, uh, of even one to two grays or one to two sieverts worth of radiation. At that point, it sounds as if we're getting into the range where uh, we could see some uh, cellular damage and, and things of that nature, and that's even without taking into account possible solar flares and things like that. Am I understanding you correctly on that? That is correct. Um, the threshold for starting to see cellular damage is about 0.1 gray, and the threshold for starting to see some 
uh, changes in memory and cognition is around one gray. And solar flares are coming in right in the middle of that range at about half a gray. So there is a definite risk uh, started to be associated now with long-duration spaceflight where an astronaut would accumulate multiple exposures to this type of radiation or this level of radiation. So we're looking at astronauts whose vision may be impaired by microgravity and whose cognition may be impaired by radiation. And that sounds pretty bad. Are there any other hazards that our listeners should know about? There is a fairly obvious one, of course, which I think gets a lot of treatment in science fiction in general. That's the, that's the um, atmospheric effects, the vacuum and loss of atmosphere. One of the little-known aspects of spaceflight is that astronauts don't breathe the same mixture of uh, atmospheric gases that we do in our comfortable uh, one atmosphere, standard atmospheric pressure, and one gravity. So there is always the question of what pressure and what percentage mix of oxygen and carbon dioxide are we going to expose the astronauts to? And there, we have a pretty good handle on that information with now going on 50 years of uh, spaceflight. But again, it's another one of the risks. But radiation and microgravity are two of the major risks. And it's something that we have limited ability to study with the current configuration of our presence in space. And that leads us directly to the proposal that you have in your article of the Translunar Laboratory. Now, your design includes spaces not only for human astronauts to carry out experiments, uh, but also for animals, specifically, you call out uh, the need to have some rhesus monkeys um, as part of the, the crew complement, if you will. Now, why is that important? One of the reasons that's important is something that most people really aren't going to think in terms of. Rats and smaller animals are quadrupeds. They move around on four legs. Monkeys can maneuver basically as quadrupeds or as bipeds. One of the very important things to understand with respect to microgravity and artificial gravity is what is the effect of the environment on long bones. And it's not until you start getting into some of the larger primates that you get a bone structure which becomes fairly close to that of human. Uh, the other aspect that's important here is, then is the cognitive ability and the ability to test the actions and abilities of the laboratory animal to follow instructions and perform a task that would assess the same type of memory that it would be for a human. The issue we have is that right now our astronauts are our laboratory animals, and that's not really fair to the astronauts. So it would be a really good idea to have a laboratory in which we can have the appropriate models in animals that would test the things without necessarily having to subject our astronauts to being a uh, laboratory subject. Wow, that's a great point. One of the things I've learned in a NASA conference is that the time of the astronauts is very, very limited. Any group doing science studies has to schedule, and they get a very, very limited access because everybody wants to be able to study the astronauts. And 
when there's only four, five, six astronauts available for a limited time, there's not a lot of research that can be done. A project may get 25 minutes a week to do their studies and their measurements. If we had establish a laboratory that has a number of animals in it, we get away from that time and that scheduling problem as well. This has been part one of a two-part interview with Dr. Ted Roberts. Tune in next time on the Bain Free Radio Hour for part two. And now here is part 46 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com. And if you're not already an Audible subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free when you try Audible free for 30 days. Or you can choose from more than 100,000 other titles. And of course, we recommend you pick a Bain title. If you're just joining us, it's the 1930s in America, but it's not the America our history books describe. In the 1860s in this world, magical abilities manifested in a small number of people from all walks of life. And with each succeeding generation, more and more people have developed these magical talents. They're called actives, and while most actives use their powers for good, not all of them do. Jake Sullivan is an active known as a heavy because he can control the force of gravity. He's a former soldier, an ex-con, and now a private eye who has been recruited into a secret organization of actives known as the Grim Noir Knights. The Knights are the good guys, and the rest of humanity needs the Knights because the evil forces of magic are about to unleash an apocalypse. Here is Bronson Pinchot with part 46 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Chapter 21 The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation. The Negro during Reconstruction was threatening enough, but Negroes with powerful magic were an inconceivable threat. At last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country, to keep the magical Negroes in check. Active magicals, because of their chaotic nature, must be kept under constant scrutiny, especially those of untrustworthy races. Woodrow Wilson, History of the American People, 1910. Banish Island, Micronesia. The PBY Silverado landed right on the ocean. The water thumped against the pontoons and water splashed rainbows over Sullivan's window. The propellers kept on turning, dragging them through the crystal waves. We've arrived, the engineer shouted, touching him on the shoulder as he moved down the aisle, apparently unsure if he was awake or not. Sullivan lifted his hat from where he'd been using it as a makeshift pillow. Thanks, he responded, stifling a yawn. His ears had popped on the way down. That was a nice flight, he lied. Whatever, pal, looks to me like you're vacationing in tropical paradise and we've got an extra five hours ahead of us to swing around a bad storm front that's coming in. It had been a terribly long flight. Sullivan had managed to sleep through most of it. His dreams had consisted of strange geometries, pieces of power stacked and fitting together over and over in an endless procession like some sort of children's game, and in each dream he still did something wrong, and Delilah still died. After they'd dropped the other passengers off in Hawaii, they'd landed at two other islands to refuel, one of which had been flying a Dutch flag. He had no idea how long it had been since they'd left the Presidio, but he'd slept a lot. When he was awake, his thoughts would drift back to the power, trying to remember it all. Looking at the surface of the being, 
was like looking at a map divided into millions of shapes that were all locked together. He used a grease pencil to draw the strange geometries on the fuselage next to him, wiping them away each time as he decided they weren't quite right. The Grim Noir had thought of them as words, the Imperium as kanji. They were both wrong. They were constructs, avatars of the power, if he could just learn how to make them perfect to meet all the unknown requirements, then he could tap into those spells too. The part of the power he'd paid the most attention to was the section relating to his own, one end of an almost hexagram. He'd tried to draw that bit during the flight, and he must have gotten something almost right, because at one point outside of Guam, just as he finished the shape, gravity's pull had shifted, and the Silverado had dropped several hundred feet in one violent jolt. He'd quickly wiped the mark away while the crew struggled to keep them from falling into the sea. They were probably smarter places to experiment with physics-altering magic than on an airplane. Now he was here. Well, maybe not a nice flight, but it sure was long. Big ocean, slow plane. Meet me at the back hatch once we come to a stop. The engineer moved on, and Sullivan tried to rub the feeling back into his cramped legs. The seats hadn't been designed for a man of his stature. A few minutes later, the only motion he could feel was the rocking on the gentle waves. The tingling had subsided in his legs enough to move, and he slung his backpack over one shoulder. The browning bullpup was still disassembled inside, as well as over a hundred pounds of gear. He used just enough power to carry it easily with one hand. It was burning hot inside the Silverado, so he'd stuffed his coat in the bag. The entire rear of the plane was a ramp that lowered with a mechanical clank. Brilliant sunlight reflected off the ocean and the distant sand. He slid a pair of round sunglasses from his shirt pocket over his eyes. One of the departing soldiers had forgotten them when he'd gotten off at Pearl Harbor. The engineer kicked a tiny rubber raft off the ramp and into the water. It ain't got no style, but it beats getting wet. Sullivan climbed down into it and nearly toppled over as it flopped about. Don't fall in, buddy. I hear these waters is filled with sharks. Good, I wondered what I was going to have for lunch, he said as he took up the little oar. The engineer spooled out the rope that was tied to the raft. I'd wish you good luck, fella. I don't know what kind of secret-type mission you're on, but we saw a mess of nip vessels out there. They ain't supposed to be out this far, so keep your head down. You too, and tell the Major thanks. Sullivan started paddling. The ocean was so clear that he could see fish swimming around the oar every time it bit the water. The beach wasn't very far, but it was hot. And his shirt was clinging to his back by the time sand ground against the bottom of the raft. He climbed out, managed to not get his boots too wet, tossed his bag onto land, and waved at the engineer, who immediately started hauling the raft back. Between the incoming storm and the Japanese Navy, they didn't want to stick around to admire the view. And it was a nice view. If he hadn't been on a mission of revenge and murder, all those funny trees swaying in the wind would be downright peaceful. But he hadn't traveled halfway around the world for peace. He'd come to smash the Geotel and then wait for his brother to come looking for it, even if he had to call Matty up and give him the coordinates himself. Behind the trees, the land rose into black rocks. The whole east side of the little island was an old volcano that had fallen in on itself. According to Pershing's memory, there was a little village in the cove created by the volcano, and that was where he'd find Southunder. Supposedly the natives were friendly enough, there were some missionaries, and traders used this place to refuel and tie up in bad weather. That was about it. So he didn't figure he'd end up on a headhunter's necklace like what always seemed to happen to the folks who wandered the South Pacific on the radio serials. On those shows, there was always a hero to come along to rescue the damsel from the cannibal stew pot. Too bad I ain't no hero. If I were a hero, then my leading lady wouldn't have died in a hole in the ground. He scowled, picked up the backpack, wished he'd bummed a smoke off the crew, and started inland. The Silverado revved up its engines and headed back out to sea, driving up a plume of salt mist as it leapt into the air. The trees were thick, but he figured the fastest way across the island would be a straight line. The whole thing wasn't even a mile across. 
It felt good in the shade, but after 15 feet of clomping through the bushes, he realized that he didn't know if they were poison snakes in all that ground cover, so he backed out to walk along the beach. At least the snakes where he'd grown up had the common decency of having a rattle on them. Either the island wasn't as sparsely populated as the general had remembered, or somebody had seen the Silverado and come to check it out. Within ten minutes, he could hear the kids in the jungle watching him. He waved and tried to smile, real friendly-like. He hadn't shaved in days, so his face was dark with scratchy new beard, and he wasn't exactly the nicest to look at to begin with, but he didn't want to get off on the wrong foot with these folks. They were his key to finding South Under. That's why his shirt was untucked to conceal his forty-five. Hey, you kids speak English? The kids were little and brown, or at least the ones he saw were before they squealed and ran away. There was no way he could have kept up with them on their own turf. A minute later, he found a narrow footpath and turned inland. Weird, colorful birds shrieked at him. The village was bigger than Pershing remembered, where there had been a handful of tiny huts on stilts with big leaves on top. There were now several wood buildings with tin roofs. The missionary shack had turned into a white house with a little steeple. He could smell meat cooking on the smoke coming from the largest building and his stomach rumbled involuntarily. An unseen dog started barking. The kids had raised the alarm. There were several adults watching suspiciously from the steps and doorways. The men were dark-skinned with curly black hair and contrary to the radio, nobody was wearing a grass skirt. He noted that half of them happened to be armed. The guns were old, but looked to be in good working order. The only woman he saw was busy herding kids inside, and he took that as a bad sign. Sullivan waved slowly. Hello. Nobody answered. One of the men spit on the ground. Another one had been interrupted in the act of butchering a hanging pig. He wiped his machete clean on the grass. Nice place you got here. There was a rustle in the underbrush to his side. What do you want? Sullivan turned slowly, glad to hear somebody speaking his language, but not liking that he'd walked right past somebody who'd probably been waiting in ambush. The man was young, surprisingly white, with reddish-brown hair and a goatee. You sound like an American. Yeah, I'm American he answered, coming out of the jungle and calmly pointing a pistol at Sullivan's chest. The gun's Belgian. He nodded. Yep, yeah, I can see that. Save GP-32 9mm machine pistol. Nice piece. The young man smiled a little, but the gun didn't move. Yeah, it was based on Browning's last design. Sullivan would have loved to whip the machine gun out of his bag and show the kid that he was wrong, but he had no doubt he'd catch a bullet if he tried that. I'm looking for somebody. Strange place to be looking. The kid stepped onto the volcanic rock, still covering him. Sullivan knew that little buzz gun had a cyclic rate that could rip an entire magazine into him before he could even move, so he was a very obliging guest. I'm guessing you came in on that PBY Silverado. You know your planes. He nodded. You know your guns. Who are you looking for? Might as well cut to the chase. Bob South on them. Never heard of him, he answered. So you best go away. He was obviously lying. You sure? Sullivan put his hand out at about shoulder height. About yay tall, he was losing his hair, probably in his fifties now, controls the weather, hates the Japanese. There was a click as a hammer was cocked behind him. Sullivan felt the steel of a barrel press against the back of his head. My friend said he don't know nobody by that name. The second had come up from the jungle on the other side of the path. These boys were good and quiet. Two Americans. Boy, I must have landed at the embassy by mistake. Nah, that's five hundred miles that away. The kid jerked his head. Best start swimming, the other one said. Sullivan wasn't in the mood. Listen, assholes, I didn't fly around the whole damn world to get turned away. Take me to South Under before I get mad. 
Can you believe the nerve of this chump? The one behind him said in a deep voice. Pirate Bob Southunder ain't real. He's a story that Jap sailors tell to explain whenever one of their ships don't come back. He's like a... a... Sea monster, the first one finished. Yeah. So you two ain't pirates? Of course not. We're... Legitimate businessmen. Sullivan snorted. Oh, good. For a minute I thought you were going to try and convince me that that was your church. He turned and waved nonchalantly toward the little white building just enough to remove the gun from the base of his neck. But y'all didn't look like priests either. He could feel the gunsel at his back automatically follow his pointing finger, and then Sullivan spiked outward. The power left him in a circular wave, bending gravity away violently. The kid went into the jungle almost like he was flying. The other dropped straight back, hit the end of Sullivan's range, and tumbled off balance into the sand. Sullivan followed him. Gravity returned to normal, and the pirate struggled to his knees. The thing that had been pressed against his neck turned out to be a British Webley 455 revolver, and Sullivan kicked it right out of the man's hands. The kid had bounced off a rubbery tree and was coming back up with that Belgian buzz saw, so Sullivan concentrated, reversed gravity, and dropped him into the air in a cloud of white sand. The villagers were interested now, and several were heading his way. The one with the machete was in front, looking pissed. Behind him was a man with a rifle that had been ancient before the Great War, and Sullivan got ready to spike the whole damn village into the ocean. I need to talk to South Under. Don't make me hurt you. The native with the old rifle said something fierce, and Sullivan didn't need to speak the language to know that he'd just been told to go screw himself. That'll be enough, a calm voice called from the largest building. Immediately, the villagers stopped and lowered their weapons. A man walked out onto the porch, shielding his eyes from the sun. What do you want, Heavy? Sullivan recognized the grim noir from Pershing's memories, though he was more than twenty years older now. He was a little thinner, had lost the rest of his hair, but the main difference was that he'd gotten a better tan. Pershing sent me. For a legendary buccaneer, he wasn't much to look at. No big hat, no beard, no parrot, or even a wooden leg. He was a completely average-looking man, small of stature and wearing simple work clothes stained with engine grease. Southunder paused to take a drink from a cup made from half a coconut. His manner was deceivingly mild. I figured that from the way you were beating on my men. You hurt, Barnes? The younger one came out of the jungle, glaring at Sullivan. I didn't know he was a mover he said, shoving his machine pistol into a shoulder holster. It was a dual rig, and he had a matching gun under his other arm as well. Gravity spiker, Sullivan corrected. Mr. Parker? I'm good, the other pirate answered as he picked his Webley off the ground and blew the sand from the cylinder. He was dark-skinned, probably a mulatto, and was a big man, not fat but bulky through the chest and arms, though not nearly as large as Sullivan. Only thing hurts my feelings. South underside. Sad day for pirates everywhere. So Pershing sent you, huh? How is the old coot? Dead, Sullivan answered. Killed by a pale horse. South under didn't seem surprised. And the others? The Portuguese was murdered by an iron guard, same with Jones. Christensen got torn apart by a demon. The chairman got their pieces. So ends the Knights of New York. Southunder thought about it for a long time. He tossed the coconut off the porch and into the bushes. His men exchanged confused glances. Apparently this was all new to them. Well, I figured this day would come. He turned and walked into the building. You ate lunch yet? Sullivan consumed all the fish they put in front of him and figured he would keep doing so as long as the Japanese girl kept putting more on the table. She batted her eyes politely when he thanked her for the fifth plate and returned to the kitchen. He told his story quickly and quietly, and now he was just plain hungry. Bob Southunder studied him with cold blue eyes. 
Sullivan could tell that he was a calculating and intelligent man, the kind of man who'd grown impatient with governments and secret societies and had decided to make war on the Imperium by himself. But he was also a friendly enough host. You sure eat a lot? So I've been told, he answered. He watched Sullivan's hands. Where's your ring? Don't have one, never took the oath. Southunder nodded. I would have figured otherwise. You've got grim noir written all over you. He didn't know whether to take that as a compliment or not, so he just grunted and kept eating. The building was mostly an open space, sort of a village common room and a long rectangular table made of planks filled most of it. More people had poured in after he'd arrived, taking up the other spots and then filling in along the wall once the chairs were taken. Apparently his arrival was interesting. The people were made up of every race he could imagine and were aged from teenagers to old men, but most of them looked to be of fighting age and in fighting shape. The only women present were the ones who kept bringing food from the kitchen. Apparently, piracy was man's work. Southunder hadn't lived this long in the shadow of the Imperium by trusting strangers. I'd have figured Black Jack would have sent at least a knight. John Moses Browning was supposed to have given me the oath, but he got hurt, and I had to leave in a hurry. The John Browning? The kid named Barnes asked from a few seats away. Yep, Sullivan said. The serving girl refilled his cup with some pungent rice wine. He kept catching her staring at him. You're pulling my leg. Southunder waved him away. He's not. We're old friends. How bad was he? Sullivan told them the story of the peace ray. The other conversations in the room tapered off to nothing, and soon everyone was listening in. When he got to the part about Isaiah Rawls trying to read his mind, a look of disgust crossed Southunder's face. He was one of the knights of New York, too, but... He paused. Never mind, it isn't right to speak ill of someone who isn't around to defend himself. Let's just say that I'm not surprised he ended up in the leadership. He was a sneaky one. The society always liked doing things in the least straightforward way possible. Maybe that's why they never liked me much. What was the other one's name? Harkness, Sullivan answered. Why? The name's familiar. I think he was one of the European grimoire that argued with Black Jack when he wanted to just break the curse that they can be done with it. There were a bunch of them. They were one of the founding families. Leave it to them to be too proud to listen to reason, thinking that they were smart enough to use Tesla's mad device. How about we go smash the damn thing right now, then? Sullivan suggested. Everybody wins. Southunder smiled. Because I don't know if I believe you yet. For all I know, you're an imp spy trying to get me to take you to it so you can cut my throat and take it back to your master. He wasn't the easily offended type. Fair enough. Sullivan looked around the crowded room. There were a few Japs within earshot, and he had no doubt the chairman would pay a fortune to anybody who ratted them out. You want to talk about this alone? Southunder chuckled. This is my crew. We've been through hell together. I trust these men much more than I trust you, stranger. He turned in his chair looking for someone. Ken, come here, please. A young Jap, leaning against the far wall, set his foot on the windowsill and came over. His face was creased with scars and half of one ear was missing. Captain, he answered gruffly. Show Mr. Sullivan here how much love you've got for the Imperium. The Jap bowed his head a bit and unbuttoned his shirt. When he opened it, even as hardened as Sullivan was, he still cringed. Despite all the things he'd seen, he hadn't seen anything like this before. Every inch of his chest and stomach had been burned or cut and was now covered in twisting black and gray scars. That'll be all, Southunder said. Yes, Captain? the Jap said as he pulled his shirt back on and returned to his lunch. Ken was one of the lucky ones we freed from a slave transport. See, his family didn't like the way the chairman was running things, so he was volunteered, 
They started working on him when he was a little boy, but the kanji just wouldn't take, and they kept on burning until they ran out of skin. He was lucky he was born Nipponese, so failing out of school didn't get him turned over to Unit 731. If he had been a Chinaman or anything else, they'd still be experimenting on him. Mr. Parker? Captain, the muscular man responded from a few spaces away. Tell our guest what happens to the Gaijin prisoners. I was on a ship running guns up the Malaccan Straits to the rebels fighting in Siam. We were boarded and taken inland. His accent reminded Sullivan of his time on the New Orleans docks, that cross between French and English that he'd never gotten used to. There was a 731 camp there. The cogs were doing surgery, cutting pieces off of people's insides, just to see how long it took them to die, giving them diseases to see how fast different plagues killed different colored folks. They'd build whole little towns in the camps, fill them with folks, whole families, and then turn containers of plague fleas loose on them, just to count how many got sick. I was lucky because I was strong, so they used me to move the bodies to the pits where they fed them to the things they created. That's where I was when Captain Southander and the Marauder bombed them bastards to hell. The young one named Barnes laughed. He never gets tired of telling those stories. Scares the piss out of the new guys so they make extra sure not to get captured. How'd you get here, kid? Sullivan asked. It was obvious he didn't like being called kid. I'm a pilot. Barnes is short for Barnstormer. I like shooting down Jap planes. Everybody needs a hobby. Pays good, too. Barnes grinned and took a swig from a bottle of mystery booze. South Under shook his head at Barnes, giving an exasperated look that told him that the kid had a story and that he wasn't helping make the point. The old pirate turned back to Sullivan. I could keep these men talking all day. Most of us have been wronged by the chairman somehow, so don't you worry about my men's loyalty. Well, that how you do most of your recruiting? Men who hate the Imperium? Some. Any man who's willing to stand against the Imperium is welcome here. I don't care if they do it for the money, revenge, or just because they like to burn things. I've got a gang of misfits, deserters, and outcasts. I split anything we capture evenly with my men and we sell it in the remaining free cities or wherever people are buying. Don't get me wrong. There's money to be made, but it's more satisfying when you pry it from scum. Any Imperium ship on the water or the sky that goes anywhere without heavy escort is mine for the taking, anywhere along their frontier. They've hunted us for years, but we're too smart, and we've given them a few black eyes. Sullivan glanced around the room. You've got, what, thirty men? What do you expect to accomplish? Oh, we won't quit until we're dead or we've killed them all, Mr. Sullivan. Southunder was a soft-spoken man, but Sullivan could tell that there was steel beneath those quiet words. Every last one. Every last one! The entire room bellowed in unison, banging their cups, stamping their feet, or hitting their rifle butts on the floor. Sullivan decided that these pirates were okay with him. That was part 46 of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pinchot. That's it for this installment of the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Thanks to Ted Roberts, whose science article is available right now for free on Bain.com. I'm Gray Reinhardt, contributing editor for Bain Books. And once again, it's been my pleasure to be your host for this episode of the podcast. Please join us next time for the Bain Free Radio Hour, where the heart of science fiction and fantasy beats strong. <laughs>